Hi everybody, okay, welcome back. We're looking today at Jeremy Duff, Elements of New Testament Greek. We're in chapter 6 on the subject of the different tenses and we're in section 6.5 today. Now just a quick recap about what we've done so far. We've looked at the three additional tenses besides the present tense, the future, the imperfect, the aorist. We've looked at what those tenses mean just in general terms and we've looked at how to form them. So you form them, you remember, by adding an epsilon augment and or a sigma suffix to the beginning and the end respectively of the stem and then for the imperfect and the aorist you need different endings as well to form the different persons and numbers. So that's where we've got to so far. There's a kind of nice logic to it. It's new stuff to learn but it's not too hard. Right now it turns out that in some cases with some verbs there are just a few, couple of complexities when you try to add epsilon augments and sigma suffixes to the stem. And those are the complexities which are dealt with in section 6.5 and 6.6. .6. And so that's what I'm going to start looking at in this video. We're going to be begin with the first little quirk that happens when you try and add an epsilon augment to some verbs, namely verbs that begin with a vowel. Let me show you what I mean. Just for illustrative purposes, let's start with a verb that doesn't display these complexities. Blepo, first person singular, present of I see. And imagine we wanted to make this imperfect, or very simple, add an epsilon augment, change the ending. Eblepon, so that means I was seeing, or I was looking, or something of that sort. Okay, so that's all fine, of course, if you want a different person or number, you'd have to make the ending appropriate, eblepes, eblepen, and so on. Now, if you imagine taking a, a different verb, now, akuo, this is a verb which begins not with a consonant, but with a vowel. So what happens if we now try and do the same thing and turn this verb into an imperfect akuon, akuon. Just look at that for a second and just uh, try to imagine saying it. Just try to imagine saying it for a second. Akuon, akuon, akuon. You can easily see where the difficult bit is, can't you? It's the epsilon alpha, which is not a diphthong, and therefore it needs to be pronounced, if you're going to write it like this, you'd need to pronounce it as two separate vowel sounds, and it's just awkward to, to say. Now, in general, of course, language evolves over time to make it easier for native speakers to say. So just think for a second, what is ea, 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 going to turn into eventually over time? Well, the way that we pronounce it, the way that we've been learning to pronounce it in Duff's book, it's quite easy to see how it might turn eh, 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 into an air eh sound. The eh, eh, epsilon alpha turns into an air. Eh. Now, just a quick caveat. We don't know that that's how they pronounce these words in the ancient world, and they probably pronounce them differently in different places. But the principle which will help you to remember how this change occurs, is that uh, words develop in such a way as to make them easier to say. And with our pronunciation system, it's very easy to remember that when you add, and here's the rule, when you add an epsilon augment to the beginning of a verb that starts with an alpha, the epsilon augment combines with the alpha to give you an eta. Ercuon. Ercuon. And that's a general rule whenever you have a verb beginning with an alpha. Similar rules apply when you have verbs beginning with some other vowels. And those are illustrated in a box here. So if you start with a verb with an alpha and you add an epsilon to it, you get an air. If you start with a verb, if you have a verb that starts with an epsilon and you add an epsilon to it, you also get and eta. And the rationale for that is easy to see as well, isn't it? It's eh, eh. Well, two short e's make a long e. Two short epsilons make a long eta. So the logic there is fairly straightforward. The only other thing to remember is if you have a verb that starts with an omicron and you add an eta to that, you end up with an o sound. And it's easier to see the rationale for that, isn't it? Because the o oh, dominates the e eh and gives rise to a longer vowel, so two vowels combined, so to speak, and it has the o sound in the long vowel. Now those are the only vowels um, in, at the start of words for which this change happens. 
Other vowels like upsilon and iota, and of course the long vowels, don't have uh, any change of this kind. Um, uh, and that's all explained uh, in the little box at the bottom of page 71. And then at the top of page 72, diphthongs follow the same logic as this, in which, an example that uh, Duff gives, an Omicron plus iota diphthong, when you add an epsilon to it, an epsilon plus uh, uh, Omicron iota diphthong, well, this combines into an O, according to this rule, and then just to get out of the way, the iota turns into an iota subscript. And that's illustrated in the case of this verb, oikodomeo, oikodomeo, which in the imperfect, oikodom, and then the ending, which Duff has got there, but I'm not going to write because if you haven't got the book in front of you, it will just confuse you. We come to the, the ending um, uh, later on. What you, all you need to think about, again, is that the diphthongs follow the same rationale um, as the vowels standing on their own. Alpha and an epsilon, when combined with an epsilon, goes to a long E sound, an eta. An omicron, when combined with an epsilon augment, goes to a long O sound. That's all you need to know. Okay, so that'll do for now. Uh, next video, we're going to look at the other complexity that arises with epsilon augments in compound verbs. But for now, keep cracking on with this. 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, five, six days a week, and we'll have you reading the New Testament in Greek in no time at all. God bless, and bye for now.